Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Hi, this is Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of Open Your Eyes. And today I have a very, very special guest, Dr. Elon Cohn, who's an eye specialist, ophthalmologist, surgeon. He does surgery on cornea and he does surgery on cataracts. He did a cornea fellowship at Vanderbilt in Nashville. He uh, has hospital affiliations at Manhattan Ioneer and Raritan Bay Medical Center. He practices surgery ophthalmology in New York and New Jersey. He's done some very innovative things in his life. He did the first implantable contact lens for people that are very, very nearsighted. I want to thank Dr. Cohen for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for the kind invitation. It's my pleasure well, to be here. Everybody wants to know about LASIK. Every patient asks me, what about LASIK? Am I a candidate for a LASIK? Explain to us exactly what LASIK is and what refractive surgery is and who's a candidate. Okay, so LASIK is basically for people who are wearing glasses and want to get rid of the glasses. And mostly we're talking about distance glasses. I'll, I'll get into that issue in a, in a little bit because the distance vision and near vision are two different entities. Uh, when we have a refractive error, what that means is our eyes are not able to focus well at distance without the aid of glasses. Those glasses could be either a positive glasses, where, whereby we become hyperopic, or negative glasses, where we become myopic. Somewhere between 40 and 50 years old, we also undergo a process called presbyopia, meaning that we lose our ability to focus at near. So what LASIK does is basically fixes near, uh, nearsightedness or farsightedness. It cannot fix presbyopia, which is the inability to, to see at near that results from aging. However, there is a technique called monovision, when we fix one eye for distance and one eye for near, that we can use in order to help people see near and distance. And not everybody is a candidate for it. Some people like it, some people don't. Now, as far as LASIK go and the candidacy for LASIK, it's a pretty complex issue. It has to do with the cornea. The cornea is the clear dome in front of the eye, okay? And what we do with LASIK, we change the curvature of the cornea and hence we change its lens property. We can steepen the cornea and make it, make it more powerful for people who need a plus power or hyperop, or we can flatten the cornea and make it less powerful for people who need a minus power. In order to be a candidate for LASIK, you need to have a healthy cornea. The cornea thickness needs to be of a certain magnitude in order to allow for the amount of prescription that you need. Also, we do a test called topography where we look at the surface of the cornea and we determine if the cornea is regular. There are some irregularities that could be induced by certain conditions, certain diseases like keratoconus or pellucid marginal degeneration that would make a person a very bad candidate for LASIK. Other things that we look at uh, for candidacy for LASIK is the total magnitude of the correction. Usually people between plus five and minus 10 are good candidates for LASIK, uh, but if you go significantly above minus 10, LASIK loses its power, and the chances for complications are significantly higher. There's where other technologies like implantable columnar lens or 
uh, what we call clear lens extraction becomes significantly more powerful in treating those conditions for these people. So the secret is finding the, the, the procedure that is right for you. Uh, not going to a LASIK center where they only do LASIK because when you go to a shoe store, you're going to buy a shoe. You need to go to someone who can perform a wide variety of surgeries and give you the right advice about the right type of uh, refractive surgery. Refractive surgery is a general term that describes all, the, all these different types of surgeries that are supposed to correct the vision. It includes LASIK, PRK, SMILE, implantable contact lens, uh, clear lens exchange, intacts, and many other procedures. A lot of patients have astigmatism. People with astigmatism, are they candidates for LASIK or refractive surgery? Yes. Many years ago, astigmatism used to be a problem with LASIK, but today it's really no problem. Today with bladeless LASIK, we use two different types of... One of the problems with astigmatism was when we create the flap with a blade, there was a risk of irregular formation of the flap, and that's a serious complication during the surgery. But today what we do most of the time is using two separate lasers. One laser creates the flap, the other laser does the treatment, and astigmatism up to minus six diopters, or minus or plus six diopters, is treated very successfully without any problems. Patients often want to know, does it hurt? What I tell patients is that most of the discomfort that they feel during the surgery is the discomfort that is imposed by the own psyche. This is, if you're very nervous and you are extremely agitated about the surgery, the surgery will be unpleasant. However, the actual surgery itself doesn't really hurt because the eyes are numb. Uh, and as long as the patient is just mildly, they don't need to be very, very cooperative. If they're just mildly cooperative, I think they won't express any major discomfort. So take me through the process of from beginning to end when somebody has LASIK. So let's talk about uh, the, the, the newest type of LASIK, which is the bladeless LASIK, okay? So we have two different lasers that are right next to each other. So the bed has to swing from one laser to the next laser, okay? In certain machines and other machines, they use the same bed. So we first take the patient to the first laser. We put something in the eye to numb the eye so the patient that, patient's eye doesn't feel anything. And then we put what's called a lit speculum. It's a device that keeps the eye open, all right? Thereafter, there is a part of the laser that basically comes and docks into the eye, and the laser creates the flap for us. We do that process on both eyes, and then we transfer the patient to the next, uh, to the next laser. When I lift the flap, and the laser does the treatment. This treatment is the treatment that actually changes the curvature of the cornea. When we put the flap back on, the, patient, uh, the patient's eye is basically back to normal. The healing process takes anywhere. Usually they don't see 2020 right away. It takes anywhere from a few hours to a few days for the vision to sharpen. But most patients are 2020 the next day. Of course, uh, they need to use some drops after the surgery, antibiotic and steroid drops to make sure that the healing process goes smoothly. Uh, but after the surgery, there is very, they're really happy. There might be some minor discomfort from dryness that is induced with the surgery initially, but as the healing progresses, the dryness slowly dissipates. So when you make the flap, how much, it's not the whole thing comes off, it's still attached a little bit. How much do you leave attached? Yes, so the flap, so let's think of a flap as a circle, okay? If the circle is 360 degrees, the flap has a hinge, has a superior hinge that stays on, and if, if a circle is 360 degrees, you can think of the flap hinge as about 20 to 30 degrees. The thickness of the flap, the thickness of a typical cornea in, in the center is about 550, 520 to 550 microns. 
So from that, the thickness of the flap is usually about 100 microns. So we cut the, the laser cuts the top 100 micron, we, we reflect it back, we do the treatment underneath the flap, and then we put the flap back up. The flap never comes off completely. It always stays connected to the eye through a hinge. Now, are you doing one eye at a time? You finish one eye and then go to the other eye, or are they both being done simultaneously? We do both eyes in one sitting. 99.9% .9 of the patients wants to have, want to have both eyes done at the same time. Very rarely I have a patient that asks me, oh, you know, I'm very anxious and I want to do one eye and see how it is, and then I do the other eye. And I, I, I really respect that and I do that for them. But it doesn't happen very common because people don't want to go through the whole process twice. They just want to do it once and get it over. So who is a candidate for it, a good candidate, and what makes somebody not a good candidate for it? People that are good candidates are people that are anywhere between plus five and minus 10. They have normal corneal thickness. They don't have any other significant eye pathology, such as severe dry eye syndrome or other many, many other eye pathologies. Uh, people that are not good candidates for LASIK are people who have been diagnosed with keratoconus or a precursor to keratoconus called form first keratoconus or have very significant dry eyes or have other eye conditions that uh, there are practically hundreds of other eye conditions that pathologies that can make you a bad candidate for LASIK. And I would say about 80 to 90% of the general population are good candidates. And what kind of technology and what kind of tests are done before LASIK to make sure that you don't have keratoconus or you don't have a severe dry eye to make sure you're a good candidate? So we do a few different tests. One of the tests is a topography test, okay? So this test basically is a simulation of the front surface of the cornea, of the, of the eye, which is the cornea where we do the surgery. That's what's where we do the surgery. It's very important. This map shows us the regularity on the cornea and the steepness on the cornea. There are certain corneas that could be too steep or too shallow that would not be good candidates for LASIK. There are certain corneas that would have certain patterns of irregularities that are not symmetrical along the superior and inferior, meaning the top and the bottom portion of the cornea. They also would not be good candidates for LASIK. There are people, we also check the corneal uh, thickness, the method called pachymetry. We check the corneal thickness, and if the corneal thickness the relationship to the amount of surgery that we need to do, which has to do with the prescription, with respect to the prescription, is thick enough, then we can confidently say that the patient is a good candidate. But if their cornea is thin, we can either resort to a different procedure which is very similar to LASIK called PRK or LASIK, L-A-S-E-K rather than L-A-S-I-K, which are pretty similar. Or we can resort to one of the other types of uh, refractive correction, such as a lens implant or clear, clear lens extraction. All this also has to do with other factors like the patient's age, the patient health, uh, the health, the general health of the eye, presence or absence of a significant cataract, etc. What age can somebody have LASIK? A lot of people, teenagers, ask me about it all the time. What age do you recommend? Mostly at 18 and older. I've done LASIK on people 18 and older, and I've done LASIK as, on people that are as old as 90. There is no upper limit to LASIK. You can even have LASIK after cataract surgery. So I have a lot of patients that are very old, had cataract surgery many years ago, I wanted to get rid of their glasses, they came and they had LASIK and they were very happy with the results. So there is no upper limit to LASIK, but there is a lower limit that is 18. Now there are certain publications uh, that 
uh, that that in which people have done experimentally LASIK on people that are younger than 18 in order to uh, prevent uh, conditions like amblyopia, which is lazy eye, where where patient has two eyes that are mismatched and they're not very compliant with wearing their contact lenses or their glasses, they have LASIK in order to prevent, prevent that from happening or making them more comfortable. Let's talk about patients who want LASIK that wear contact lenses. How do we handle those people? When what is important is not to wear your contact lenses. If we, now there are two contact lenses, soft and hard contact lenses, okay? Soft contact lenses interfere with the shape of the cornea much less than hard contact lenses. So what we want to accomplish is that when the patient is wearing the lens, the lenses will be the hard contact lens or soft contact lens, that lens will change the curvature of the cornea, okay? At the day of the screening, we want to make sure that the patients are free of the contact lens where at least three days prior to the measurements of the topography. Sometimes patients are wearing contacts and come to our office uh, wearing contacts and they say, I want to be screened for LASIK. We do the screening, but we tell them that, listen, in order to get an accurate topography and accurate measurements, we want you to be free of contact lenses three days prior to coming here again. So it's very important to emphasize that it's not important to not be without the contacts before the surgery, but before the measurement. You can wear the contact even on the day of the surgery. Go to the surgery, just take it out and have the surgery done. But it's very, very important on the day of the screening when all the measurements are done, if you're wearing soft contacts, you're free of those soft contacts for at least three days prior to the surgery. And if it's hard contacts, it's, the story is more complex. It's usually about three weeks because hard contacts can change the curvature of the cornea to a much higher degree than soft contacts. Tell me about some of the side effects that you look for post-LASIK. So I'll tell you the common side effects that we used to have. The, 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 with the modern LASIK, a lot of the side effects that I'm talking about, I'm talking about our history, unless somebody is still using those ancient devices. One of the most common side effects was glare and halos, okay? And that was a result of uh, spherical aberrations that were caused onto the cornea. So the cornea was supposed to be non-spherical. And sometimes with the flat beam treatment, it made the cornea spherical, and that's caused spherical aberration that causes them to see glare and halos at night. With the, with the next generation of lasers, like the Allegretto, which, which I use, uh, this is extremely uncommon. So this is one of the post-op complications. There could be many complications during the surgery. There could be complications with the formation of the flap, there could be complications such as wrinkles on the flap if the, if the flap sometimes is not placed properly or if, if it's placed properly and the patient rubs his or her eyes, the, the flaps early during the procedure, early after the surgery, the flap could be displaced and those striae can form and reduce the vision. Of course, this is something that could be treated and I actually uh, see a lot of these patients referred by other surgeons uh, for treatment. Uh, the treatment is not very easy, but this is definitely treatable. There are other conditions like uh, when they use manual uh, or blade uh, to cut the flap, sometimes there is a buttonhole, the flap is cut in an irregular way, and this is also something that I can fix, but it is very, very difficult. It is a surgical challenge to do it, I've done it on many patients and they did very well. Uh, other complications, let's talk about some of the most horrific complications that happen with LASIK. One of the most feared complications is a bacterial infection underneath the flap, which is very difficult to treat. The flap needs to be lifted and washed and irrigated with antibiotics and the proper antibiotic cultures need to be sent 
and the proper antibiotics needs to be instituted. Another complication that, again, it's not very common, but you see it here and there, is what we call Sands of Sahara. And that is a, is a swelling in the layer of the flap. And when that happens, we put the patient on strong steroid drops to reduce the inflammatory process. And they usually fare very well. What can patients do prior to LASIK to help make their LASIK treatment more successful? Cleaning their lids, any type of drops, what do you recommend? Yes, first of all, keeping their lids clean. I, I recommend that on the day of the surgery for, for girls, definitely not to wear a makeup, okay? And everybody, I think they need to clean their eyes with lid scrubs, okay? There are certain pads that you can use to clean your eyelids a few days before the laser. You can start that process a few days before the laser. Doing that reduces the chance of microbial uh, contamination or inflammatory processes significantly. Um, another thing, the most important thing to do before the LASIK is to have a good night's sleep and to be totally relaxed about it. This is something that's been done for more than 20 years now. This is not a new process. Uh, you know, do not be too nervous. You need to be relaxed. The more relaxed you are, the easier is it for the surgeon to do the treatment and the faster it is and the less stressful it is for you as a, as a patient. Now, some things that have been in the press over the years is this intractable pain after LASIK. Uh, how can we avoid it? Is it avoidable? And it's very, very rare, but it, if it does happen, what could be done about it? Most of the sources of pain after LASIK is related to the fact that the eyes are extremely dry. The best way to avoid it is to recognize it. That's, that's, that's why the, uh, the exam, the initial exam to determine if a patient is a good candidate is so important because if somebody has a severe dry eyes and they have LASIK, it could tip it over and make the severe dry eye into a very severe dry eye. And then the patient can suffer in, suffer in the long term from chronic dry eyes and they, it, it could be very, very miserable. In that condition, they can use, of course, artificial tears very frequently. We can apply uh, punctal plugs that plug the drainage of the eye partially to allow more tear to accumulate in the eye. And there are also several types of prescription medications that we can prescribe for dry eyes that, that make the patient more comfortable. Also, sometimes topical steroids could be prescribed to, uh, to lessen the pain and make the patient more comfortable. But again, I think the best scenario is to avoid LASIK in patients who are at risk. Recognizing who is at risk and who is not at risk is one of the biggest parts of doing LASIK surgery, one of the talents that a sur surgeon needs is to recognize who is and who is not a good candidate. And what happens if somebody had LASIK uh, 20 years ago and now they're getting cataracts? Does it make the cataract surgery more complicated and more complicated to calculate the proper intraocular lens replacement? Very good question. It's actually very interesting. So, so the actual surgery itself is not more complicated. The surgery is exactly the same as a regular cataract surgery. But as you pointed, what is more complicated is the calculation of the type of, of the power of the lens that you need to put into the eye in order to give the patient the best possible vision. We have a lot of new formulas and for calculation of the lens. And I actually wrote the chapter in, in a new book that came out for surgeons how to calculate after refractive surgery, after LASIK surgery, the lenses for, uh, for cataract surgery. But the modern formulas uh, take into account many different factors and they are a lot more accurate than what used to be a few years ago, which we had a lot of cases of patients 
when they had LASIK and it was very difficult to calculate their lenses. What I suggest is patients that undergo LASIK keep all their records, keep the records of their topography, their prescription, before the LASIK surgery, after the LASIK surgery. If we have this historical information from the patient, it makes the calculation a lot more accurate. Now let's just back up a second. For those people that are very, very nearsighted and they're not a candidate for LASIK, what are their options? And if you could explain it a little bit. Okay, so there are two groups of patients. The, the patients that are younger, younger than 40, and older than 40, okay? For the patients that are younger than 40 and they still have their accommodation intact, meaning that they, their lens in their eye is still flexible and is able to accommodate and allow them to see both near and distance. For those patients, I would recommend the implantable contact lens. I think that is a technology that is both reversible it's ex it works extremely well, and it doesn't depend on the degree of the prescription, meaning that if the prescription is higher, it doesn't make the surgery more challenging, okay? This is good because they can preserve their natural accommodation. It does not take their legs away, all right? The second group of patients that are patients that are somewhere between 40 and 50 or over 50, and we know that they don't have a very good accommodation anymore, or they all, almost altogether lost their accommodation. In those groups of patients, we can take out their lens and put a lens that is a multifocal lens that will allow them to see both near and distance. So that, that procedure is called clear lens exchange. And the first procedure I, I talked about is called uh, uh, implantable contact lens or implantable columnar lens. Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Unbelievable technology that somebody who's minus 15, what, could that, what that could do to help those people's lives and improve their life it's just incredible. Yeah, I, I see the results in the office. Great. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Now, that leads us into the next topic, which is cataracts. Yes. Uh, tell us what a cataract is and who needs cataract surgery. Okay, so we talked about the cornea. Cornea is the clear dome in front of the eye, and that's the first lens that the light encounters when it enters the eye. So as you enter the eye and go deeper into the eye, you encounter a second lens which we call the crystalline lens. When we are young, this lens is both clear and flexible and allows us to see near and distance. As we get older, this lens becomes gradually more and more rigid. And this rigidity prevents, prevents us from being able to see near very well, and that's why we need reading glasses. But a stage after that is the formation of the cataract. Now, it's not only rigid, but it also loses its clarity from a lens that was crystal clear. It slowly becomes yellow and then brown. And if you don't do anything about it, eventually you become black and you can become completely blind with it. Uh, actually, I did a few black cataracts today in, 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 the, surg in the surgical, uh, in my surgical office. But uh, basically, cataract is a hindrance to the entry of light into the eye. So the lens, our lens, inside the eye becomes cloudy and in order to see clearer we need to take this lens out and we replace it with another lens with another uh what we call implantable ocular lens or intraocular lens is there anything people could do to slow down the cataract process as far as lifestyle goes Yes, first of all, any, anything that slows down your aging will slow down your cataract formation in general. For example, if you keep a healthy lifestyle, lots of antioxidant, healthy food, all of that, I believe that definitely will slow down your cataract as well. One of the other things that are important in formation of cataract is exposure to ultraviolet light. 
So wearing a good grade ultraviolet blocking glasses is very important because there is a high correlation between exposure, high exposure to ultraviolet light and formation of cataract. Ultraviolet light, by the way, can also cause formation of macular degeneration. So it's very important to try to stay away from excessive ultraviolet radiation by having a good pair of sunglasses, especially when you're at the beach or when you're some, somewhere that the sun is very strong. What kind of diseases or medications could, get some, could cause somebody to get a cataract a little bit sooner? So people who have a wide range of inflammatory conditions can get cataracts sooner. People who are on, even, even young people who are on oral steroids for a prolonged period of time can get specific type of cataract called posterior subcapsular cataract. And there are a wide host of uh, other metabolic disorders that can cause cataract to form earlier. But mostly, most of the cataract, 95% of all cataracts are basically age-related. And the average age where you get it is somewhere between 60 and 65. Now, let's... I've done cataract surgery on people who are in their early 30s, and I've done cataract surgery in people in their 90s, all right? But the average is about 60 to 65. Now, when does somebody need cataract surgery? And if you could walk us through the process of cataract surgery. Yes. So a lot of people who have cataract, and this is a little bit hard to believe, but a lot of people who have cataract, they don't really have the symptoms, especially if both eyes developed the cataract in parallel, meaning that the degree of cataract is pretty similar in the right and the left eye. So what happens is that things become slowly lose their color. We lose our contrast sensitivity. We can also lose our visual acuity with the cataract. And slowly, slowly the cataract becomes darker and darker. But the thing about it is that it does not happen overnight. So a lot of people, it's not like you wake up in the morning one day and say, oh, damn, I cannot see today, I have cataracts. It doesn't happen like that suddenly. It's usually a, a very long process and it evades detection. That's why it's important to have routine eye exam on, a schedule, on, a, on a regular intervals in order to make sure that your eyes are checked. Many people who have cataracts and their visions, I, I have some patients that are legally blind from cataracts. And when you ask them, how is your vision? They tell me, doctor, my vision is good. I have no problem. And, it's the, and those are the patients that both eyes went at the same rate. And they basically never realized that anything. Now, the same process can happen in a patient when the, the one eye is 20-20, and then the other eye is just slightly worse and they notice that because now they have something else to compare it with. The patients where both eyes go together in the same rate, they have nothing to compare it with. Their vision is just getting weaker and weaker, and they don't realize it because there is no point of comparison. So, doctor, they'll say, when do I need cataract surgery? You need cataract surgery when the cataract becomes hindrance in your daily life. There is really no reason, you know, there, there, there used to be a, an old uh, belief in, among surgeons that you do cataract surgery, you need to wait for the cataracts to become mature, okay? That usually referred to the old type of cataract surgery when we used to open the eye, take the cataract up manually, and then put a lot of sutures to close it. It was a much riskier procedure. It was a procedure that is much harder. Today, cataract surgery is an is a, is a easy process, and you need cataract, the, to answer your question, you need cataract surgery when the cataracts become some type of hindrance. For some people, they, it becomes difficult to see well at night. For some people, they see glare and halo at night when they drive. Sometimes the reading becomes difficult, and sometimes in general, they feel that their vision is blurry. But if the cataract is affecting your vision and your quality of life, you should have it done. There's really no, re no good reason to wait for it because the more you wait with today's new technologies, 
the harder the cataract gets and the riskier the surgery becomes. So if you remove it earlier, it is less traumatic to the eye, it is less risky, and the outcomes are usually better. And you have a lot more years left in your life to enjoy that good vision. Walk us through the procedure. So there are two types of cataract surgery. That cataract surgery where we do that with a laser, that's called laser enhanced cataract surgery. And we have the old fashioned uh, blade based cataract surgery. Let me walk you through the blade based and then we go to the laser. With the cataract surgery, uh, what, what we do, we basically we put topical drops on the eye to numb the eye. And then we use a device I told you before called the lit speculum to keep the eye open. All right. And then with very specialized blade, I make two micro incisions into the eye and I introduce a, de a device into the eye, it's called the viscoelastic, that it basically, it's a thick fluid that keeps the eye inflated, all right? This viscoelastic is, uh, it, it keeps the eye formed for me. Then we go into the eye and we make a small dent in the capsule that covers the lens. The lens is sitting inside the capsule. We make a dent in that capsule and manually with a forcep, we tear that capsule and form a, as much close to a perfect circle as we can, okay? After that process, I go in with a cannula and I hydrate the lens. The hydration purpose is to separate the lens material from the capsule. After that, we go, I go in with a phaco emulsification device, which is basically an ultrasound device. You can think of it almost as a jackhammer that goes back and forth and side to side, okay? And what this does, it has a hole in the middle. It goes and slowly breaks the cataract into tiny pieces and eats it up. Okay, now in this process, we need to be pretty careful because if we use too much of this energy, okay, the use of too much of this energy can cause damage to the inner layer of the cornea. So this is something that you need to be very careful. That's one of the parts of the surgery. Another part that is very challenging is the formation of the capsulorexis. For example, one of the most common complications of cataract surgery is when you're trying to make a capsulorexis, you're trying to make that round opening of the capsule and the capsule actually runs out and it get, gets torn. And when that happens, the lens can fall into the back of the eye and that's a complication. The patient needs to go to retina surgery. The retina surgeons need to take the lens out of the back of the eye and, it's, and it's a, the surgery becomes significantly more complicated. Uh, so, Critical stages is creation of the wound. The wound needs to be created in a very, very special manner with three tiered layer in order for it to collapse upon itself because we don't need a suture to close it, okay? So one of the challenges is the creation of the wound. The second challenge is creation of this round capsule rexes. And the third challenge and the hardest challenge is actually the phaco emulsification itself, the, the process where the ultrasound or the jackhammer is removing the cataract. After the cataract is removed, we use a special device that basically sucks in the remains, the sticky remains of the cataract that we call the cortex out of the capsule. And we inflate the capsule. Now we have a capsule that has a round opening, okay? The back is closed and the lens is out. So what, what we have to do now is to replace the faulty lens that we took out with an artificial lens. So we have a special lenses that are folded into an injector that goes through that microscopic incision and injects the lens into the eye the lens goes into the eye and basically unfolds inside of the capsule. After that, we use an irrigation and aspiration device to remove all the viscoelastic material and we hydrate the wounds and the eye, there is 
99.9% of the cases, there is no need for any stitches. And the eye goes back, uh, you know, the patient goes back to, to normal. Now, in order to make the surgery safer and more predictable, they came up with the laser cataract surgery. The laser can do a lot of the critical stages of the surgery in order to make the surgery both safer and it can also in, in correct some aberrations on the cornea, like astigmatism, that can cause the vision after the cataract surgery with the old-fashioned surgery to be somewhat blurry or need glasses to correct that, okay? So when we do the cataract surgery with the laser, the laser can do a few things. The laser can form the incisions for us, the incisions to enter the eye. Rather than doing with the blade, the laser can do that. The laser can also put arcs on the cornea to correct astigmatism. The laser can form the most accurate capsulorexis. I mean, you can imagine that a automatic, automated device would be significantly more, more accurate because one of the very important aspects of cataract surgery is to have the capsulorexis, which is the round opening. It needs to be both centered it needs to be of a perfect size, preferably between five and five and a half millimeter, and it needs to be as round as possible. And it's not that easy to achieve all of these things manually, whereas the laser does it within two seconds perfectly. Uh, another thing that the laser does is reduce the amount of, you remember that I talked before about the damage that can be caused to the endothelial layer of the cornea with the laser, with the ultrasound probe or with the jackhammer. What the laser does, the laser cuts the lens that we're trying to remove into tiny little cubes. And rather than having to go and using a lot of jackhammer power or ultrasound power to suck out the lens, we can just suck it out with suction alone or with just a little bit, a lot less ultrasound energy. And this helps avoid significant injury to, to the inner layer of the cornea. So we have less corneal swelling and less damage to endothelium. After that, the process is pretty much the same. We implant the lens and we have different variety of lenses that we can implant. We can implant, either implant a monofocal lens, which is, which is the lenses that most insurance companies cover, or we can use a multifocal lens, which are lenses that allow you to see near and distance at the same time. Uh, most recently, we, now we have a, a, a trifocal multifocal lens, a lens that with which you can see near, intermediate, and distance, which, which I put in a lot of care patients extremely happy with. We can also use lenses that can correct significant amounts of astigmatism. For example, I had uh, today I had a patient that had almost five diopters of astigmatism that is extremely hard to correct with laser. And I put a very uh, high power toric lens in his eye and uh, you know, he did very well with that. Now is cataracts done one eye at a time or both yes, eyes? Yes, cataract is done always one eye at a time. That's for safety because cataract is opposed to LASIK. LASIK is done on the outer surface of the eye. Cataract is what we call an intraocular procedure, which is, which is a procedure where we enter the eye, okay? So because we're entering the eye, the risks could be higher for infection, et cetera. So we like to do cataract one eye at a time, just in case if there is an infection or a complication in one eye, we don't want it to happen also to the other eye. Is cataract surgery painful? Cataract surgery is very similar to LASIK. It's really not painful. Uh, and again, I will go over the process again. It's, it's really the state of mind of the patient and the amount of stress that they internally perceive that creates the discomfort. But during cataract surgery, the eye is numb and the pain should be minimal, all right? There are two ways to do the surgery. We can use an injection into the eye that completely numbs the eye or we can use topical drops. And depending on the type of patient and uh, their level of cooperation, I decide which patient gets which. Most of my patients I do with topical drops because I think, I think it's safer avoiding an injection into the eye and avoiding 
possible complications or bleeding that can happen with that. But sometimes during some types of cataract surgery, there could be certain level of discomfort. And again, it's very individual. I would say 95% of the patients uh, don't experience any significant level of discomfort during the surgery. Now, when, with the laser, is the whole cataract surgery done with the laser, or is it just partial part of the cataract surgery done with laser? Very good question, Gary. Yeah. So, as I described, the, the laser does very critical key factors during the surgery. The surgery is still done by the, by the surgeon. The, surge, the laser cannot perform the whole surgery. But the laser aids in the critical parts that are risky. It doesn't eliminate the risk of cataract surgery, but it significantly reduces. And re it also reduces the trauma of the surgery. And how long does a patient typically have to wait between the two eyes to get the cataract surgery? I usually have them wait about two weeks, but it's, it's up to the patient. Sometimes the other eye is very good. Sometimes they have one eye that is 20-20 and the other eye is 26 to 27 with cataract surgery. We do only one eye and say, listen, let's wait until it's time for the other eye. And sometimes you wait two weeks to do the other eye if both eyes have cataract. A lot of time, one of the most common things that happens is that the cataracts are not the same as I described. One eye is a lot worse than the other. The patient comes to me and says, doctor, this eye is good. I don't want you to touch it. Just do this eye. This eye doesn't see very well. And as soon as I do that eye, that eye now becomes the good eye and they have a point of comparison. And they see, oh, gee, this eye doesn't see as well as I thought that it sees. Doctor, please do it as soon as possible. On average, the answer is two weeks, two to four weeks. Of course, there's a disadvantage to the patient to do just one eye because if they want to get multifocal implants, they lose that opportunity if they're going to wait a year or two. Is that correct? correct? That's correct. That's correct. Because those multifocal implants, I've seen many of your cases, it's a miracle. They could, they could read, they could see distance, and all of a sudden they're 70 years old. It was like when they were 35 again. Yes, I have. I, I, it's very funny that you mentioned. I have patients that are like in their late seventies. They come to my office. They have these lenses in their eyes. They come with their children. Their children are in their fifties or sixties, and they come with their children. And their children are wearing these glasses, and and they're amazed that their 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 parents can read without glasses, and they can see distance, and they don't need glasses. So, doctor, can we have the same thing done unto us? I know it's it really is a great thing. Talk about the pre-op. Is there anything the patient could do, like with LASIK, to make them have a better outcome, like cleaning their eyelids, some are like before? Yes, there is no need to clean the eyelids. During the, the surgery, we have a very strict criteria for cleaning the lids. Of course, it's always good to keep your lids clean regardless of surgery or no surgery. But uh, the, 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 a few things. we give the patients three drops to use using starting three days before the surgery. This drops a steroid drop, a non-steroidal drop, and a antibiotic drops. The per these are prophylactic drops. The antibiotic in order to increase the concentration of antibiotic in the eye and prevent infection. The steroid and the non-steroidal is in order to prevent something called uh, any type of swelling and something called uh, cystoid macular edema. Uh, the other thing that the patient must do that after 12 midnight, the night of the surgery, you should not eat anything. I had one patient uh, a few weeks ago that came to my office for surgery and they were waiting for surgery. And the anesthesiologist comes and tells me, Dr. Cohen, he cannot have surgery, he just ate. So I went to him and I told him, uh, listen, didn't they tell you that you're not, didn't, didn't we give you a sheet that it says you're not supposed to eat after surgery? He says, yes. So didn't the nurse explain it to you and tell you that you're not supposed to eat the night after midnight after the surgery? You just had a full breakfast. How come? He says, yes, yes, they explained it to me. So why did you eat? I was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, we had to cancel the surgery on that patient that day. But of course, you're not supposed to eat past midnight before the day of the surgery. And how about after the surgery? Talk about the post-op care. So what I say, the post-op care is basically as long as you use your drops, okay? You are not limited the way that I do the surgery and other, it, it varies widely from surgeon to, to surgeon. 
in terms of their instructions. But I tell my patients that there is nothing that they cannot do. After the surgery, they can go run, they can go to the gym, they can lift weights, they can do whatever they want. Uh, when the surgery is done in top, under topical conditions, there is not even a patch on the eye. So their eye is open, they just have a shield to remind them not to touch the eye, and they can go back to, your, to all their daily activities. The only thing that I would tell them not to do for two weeks is swimming, because there might be some bacteria in the water that can cause an infection. But other than that, running, exercising, lifting, washing the dishes, whatever you need to do is not a problem. How about if the patient already has macular degeneration or glaucoma and now they have a cataract? Okay, so the patients, let, let's talk about each one of them separately. Let's, let's start with macular degeneration. A patient that has macular degeneration and has cataract has two things that are limiting their vision, the cataract and the macular degeneration, okay? We can take care of the cataract during cataract surgery, but the macular degeneration is significantly more challenging. Macular degeneration happens at the level of the retina, at the macula where, the, where it's the center of the vision. The architecture of the macula becomes distorted, and that's why the patient doesn't see well. Now, many times I heard, you know, retina surgeons tell the patients, hey, so you have a cataract, but you have a macular degeneration. There is no point of doing the cataract surgery. Sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not true because many times the cataract is such that if you remove the cataract, the patient gets a lot more use of their peripheral vision the colors become brighter, although the central vision doesn't change and doesn't become a lot clearer. The peripheral vision becomes significantly clearer and it adds to their functionality. But what you need to keep in mind is that there is a potential to the retina, okay? And the cataract is adding to the hindrance to the vision, is reducing the vision. When we take the cataract out, the vision will improve but it will improve to the degree that the macular degeneration will allow. Now, let's, let's talk about the second part of your question, which is the glaucoma. Patients that have glaucoma also, depending on the degree of the glaucoma, can have a combination of different procedures during the cataract surgery to alleviate the glaucoma as well. It doesn't uh, cure the glaucoma, but it can reduce the pressure that is a major factor in the progression of the glaucoma. One of these things is eye stent, which is a tiny little stent that we put in the filtration system of the eye during the cataract surgery. That, so the cataract surgery improves their vision and this tiny stent reduces their pressure. So this is one of the things that we do with people with glaucoma. As true with people with macular degeneration, when you have glaucoma and you have cataract, when you do the cataract surgery, if your vision is limited from glaucoma, your vision will improve to the degree that the glaucoma will allow. From my experience, glaucoma doesn't usually limit your visual acuity until a very late stage of glaucoma. We are starting to get a big influx of immigrants into New Jersey, especially people from very warm climates. And we're starting to see like a little film on the eye that goes into the cornea called a pterygium. What's new in preventing pterygium, pterygium surgery? How can we help these patients? Okay, first of all, in, in terms of prevention, the, the pterygium is usually from exposure, again, to ultraviolet radiation very early in life. So it's between somewhere between 10 and 20 years old, they have high exposure to ultraviolet radiation, strong sun. Usually we see pterygium in regions of the world that are equatorial. For example, in Mexico, uh, in, in, in Australia, the, the, there's a very strong sun and the, the incidence of pterygium is extremely high. Uh, the, the treatment of pterygium is pterygium surgery. So there are a few different types of pterygium surgery. We used to just cut the pterygium out and hope that it doesn't grow back, but unfortunately, and if you just cut it bare like that, in more than 50%, it does grow back. 
The technique that I use is to take the pterygium out, cut the pterygium, and use a healthy conjunctiva from elsewhere in the eye along with stem cells from the eye itself. Those stem cells are key in preventing the recurrence of the pterygium. The stem cells basically define the border of the cornea and they tell the invading cells, hey, this is corneal territory, please do not invade in this region. And the, the success rate with that procedure is very, very high. It's close to 99%. Well, that's fantastic. I want to thank Dr. Cohen for spending time with us today. He's a wealth of knowledge. He practices in New Jersey and he practices surgery in uh, New York. Dr. Cohen, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way they could do that? Uh, you can call any of my offices. My office number in New York is 212-764-2020. And the number in New Jersey is 732-679-6100. Uh, if you want to ask me any questions via email, you can always email me at Ilan Cohen, I-L-A-N-C-O-H-E-N-M-D at gmail.com. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, for being so generous with your time. You're such a wealth of knowledge. That was fantastic. I know our audience is going to really appreciate it. Thank you Thank so you much. For inviting me. Thank you very much. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.